meeting of the Heart TOD Working Group. Uh, the meeting was held February 24th, 2021, and this is the presentation that was provided at the meeting. The way we organize the presentation, Nicole McCleary with Heart is going to provide an introduction. Uh, I'm Steve Shoecraft. I'm going to carry us through a project briefing, um, and I led the discussion during the call, and then we'll close it out. Good afternoon. I'm Nicole McCleary, project manager for the TOD pilot project. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about what the TOD pilot project is. And this is a study that's designed to help shape the future of Tampa and Hillsborough County communities. Um, this project is served by enhanced transit of the BRT and the extended, the proposed extended streetcar um, project. So what we are doing is really um, trying to understand and identify opportunities for transit-oriented development along the corridor for enhanced transit service for downtown. Um, some of the things that we're looking at is to protect and improve community character, livability, and resilience, encourage a diverse mix of transportation supportive uses, um, to create safe, walkable, um, bikeable street networks, and to ensure contact sensitivity for buildings of the future in public spaces. We also wanna improve access both locally and regionally to destinations. So um, we have an awesome study team and that's composed of Heart, your project sponsor. We also have uh, City of Tampa, Hillsborough County, Hillsborough MPO and the Planning Com Commission. Uh, we have a wonderful working group that provides feedback and gives us information about um, what they'd like to see within the study area, how they'd like to see the study area grow, as well as providing us with um, information of what's going on in the study area right now, what their needs are. Um, and then we have a great consultant team that's headed up by HDR that includes SB Friedman, Placervia, Street Sense, and Playbook. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I said previously, our TLD working group is comprised of neighborhood representatives, institutions, developers, um, really um, community businesses within the area, within the study area, and it's an informal non-voting body. Um, the great thing about this is it's really an open group, so people within the study area are open to participate. We've been meeting every two months and it's led by heart as well as uh, the consulting team. So information about meetings are held on the website and um, we look forward to your, your participation. So I think with that, um, Steve, I can hand it off to you. Sure, thanks, Nicole. So I'm going to provide a, an update on where we stand with the project and um, report on some of the findings from our early research. So as this is a third meeting, we're a little bit beyond um, some of the early discussions that we had regarding goals and visions for the project and where we're headed. And um, we're starting to talk about the direction that the plan is taking. Um, as Nicole mentioned, and she covered the basis of this, is this is about TOD potential and opportunities along the plan routes for Heart's arterial VRT project and for the City of Tampa Streetcar Extension project. I have a map that shows that in a second. Um, Nicole also reviewed the project goals. And again, it's about creating um, districts and neighborhoods that benefit from access to transit and support the transit investment plan by the community. Overall, it's an 18 month effort organized in three broad phases of work. Our current work is to, um, we've completed the context assessment, which is all the background research, which is the, the top um, element on that graphic. We're continuing with a working group and a study team of the partners for the project in crafting policies and strategies. Uh, and we're planning for more large scale public engagement activities and outreach activities later in the spring. The context assessment and the briefing book are two of the early documents that we've prepare, prepared to um, report conditions along the corridor and start to start to synthesize what we've learned as we've looked at what's happening. So the context assessment is the real deep dive 
into the specifics. The briefing book is a little bit more accessible and a little higher level review of what we learned. Uh, it also provides a good solid introduction to the project. So if you have a chance, and we'll share the website information later in the presentation after the discussion, um, take a look at the briefing book and that'll give you a good idea of where, what, we've, what we've learned, what the project's about, and where we're headed. Um, the study area is the communities and areas within walking distance of the planned corridor. So on this map, you'll see um, downtown Tampa is on the right-hand side. USF is at the top left corner of that map. And the blue line is the arterial BRT project. The circles indicate the stop locations. And then there's a hatch line that shows the, the kind of the limits of the neighborhoods, limits of the areas and neighborhoods that, that allow one to walk to a stop. Um, this also shows the other transit services that we're, that we're looking at that impact development and livability and competitiveness along the corridor. The streetcar project is highlighted in orange, um, which connects Ebor City to Channel District, Water Street, the south end of downtown through the heart of downtown. And then that sort of pink, purple, magenta, whatever color that is, is um, that's the proposed regional rapid transit line, which provides longer haul service from way up into Pasco County and Wesley Chapel through downtown Tampa, west to West Shore, across the bridge into St. Pete. So this is the longer haul service and the circles around, this, um, around that line in the same color show where they're proposing stops. So these are, the bottom line here is that um, there's, really distinct um, benefits to these communities with regional, local and regional access by these important investments in transit. Um, it's a very, it, there's really high growth projected for the corridors. It's kind of the dumbbells, the south end and the north end. So the map on the left-hand side that we call the activity density map is the population and employment projected um, along the corridor. And you can see that darker green is really high density activity downtown. Some increases in density and intensity along the corridor north of the Hillsborough River and over toward USF. On the right hand side, we look at, um, we, we use mapping like this to raise issues and questions about equity um, and accessibility to the service and, and those folks that may benefit and also may be impacted by changes proposed with the project. So we looked at the communities along the corridor where that have high concentrations of um, people and families below the poverty line, um, minority populations, older, high concentrations of older folks, high concentrations of younger folks, both of whom may be more reliant on transit as a way to get around or walking and biking as a way to get around. Um, the number of uh, households that don't own cars and the number of households that have people in them that, that um, walk or bike or take transit to work that don't have a car commute. So all of these folks, the indicates general levels of transit dependency, um, but it also tells us about communities that could be impacted in a negative way by changes in development patterns. Um, so we wanna be sensitive to where we're proposing change and understand how that could influence the surrounding communities. Uh, this map shows the land use and development conditions. So this is kind of an old school planning map that we use to try to figure out what the distribution of land uses are, how they change, what the differences are in different places of the corridor. And the way we've presented it in the context assessment is by area. So on the left hand side, to the north end of the corridor is the Fowler USF area. Um, generally more auto oriented kinds of development. So places where you drive to, you park, and then you go to the destination. Um, the North Florida, Nebraska corridor, which is north of the Hillsborough River along Florida, then it turns and goes up Nebraska to Fowler. Also a lot more auto-oriented uses in that location. Um, not as easy to walk to get to where you want to go. And sometimes the street conditions and sidewalk conditions aren't really very friendly to people that are walking. Seminole Heights and Tampa Heights in the center of the corridor, primarily residential neighborhoods with a thin band, a relatively thin band of commercial and mixed use development along the frontage of Florida Avenue. So these are relatively stable um, and stable and changing neighborhoods. We're trying to understand that neighborhood dynamic and how um, conditions along the corridor could influence it. And then at the south end, so the south end of Tampa Heights, if you think about south of Columbus and then south of Palm Avenue, 
um, to the interstate. And then from 275 is the core of downtown. We're looking at those areas as well. So Tampa Heights is um, the south end of Tampa Heights where Armature Works is. Um, there's a mix of both those popular destinations like Armature Works, but also um, Metropolitan Ministries and other public service uses that attract um, folks and provide benefits and services to the community. Um, and then downtown Tampa, which is really our core, most urban walkable place in the region, um, and also a place that really benefits from transit accessibility. Uh, there's a lot of jobs down there and folks along the corridor would have easy access to those jobs with improved service. We also look at the form of development. So we think about what, like, what these places really feel like when you use them and move through them. And we have represented along the corridor almost the whole spectrum of what exists in the region from newer auto oriented shopping centers and malls to um, big box commercial, big foot, large footprint retail centers. And then um, when we move to the right on this spectrum, we get to more of the mid-century Main Street condition, which is what exists in pockets along Florida Avenue. The more traditional Main Street, where all of the buildings are up to the sidewalk and there's storefronts that line both sides of the street. That's really what's happening along North Franklin Street. And then downtown is um, large-scale development on a relatively small block-by-block -block basis. Um, really highly walkable, um, generates a lot of uh, support for transit service gener generates a lot of transit trips um, and there's uh, with opportunities for infill so even on that little graphic at, on the right top right corner of the screen you can see there's a lot of vacant sites and a lot of vacant lots that can support new development to help make downtown more walkable and more pedestrian friendly um, and attract the kinds of activities that that people want to see both the residents that live there and the people that are visiting downtown the couple forms that we don't have along this quarter, which exist elsewhere. And the idea for this study is that what we recommend could be applied in other parts of the county are the larger scale suburban, like the corporate campuses that you see down along I-4, up on the east end of um, Fowler and Fletcher Avenues, and the large master plan communities we see in the more suburban parts of the county. And those places are really challenging to serve with transit because of the amount of parking, the distance between buildings, the distance between streets and, and entries to buildings, um, they're much more challenging than the areas we're dealing with. And this spectrum that we show here from downtown is already very transit oriented. It, it can always be improved, but it's got a lot of what you need to be transit oriented. At the, the left side of this image is the auto oriented regional centers. These are the least walkable, the least transit oriented. It's gonna require a little bit more work and more time for them to transform to become more transit-oriented. Um, where we are in the process now is we're looking at um, starting to organize and um, think more carefully about planning and policy making process. Um, and this is kind of that sequence that we're working through now to move from understanding the opportunities and challenges with new development. So where can change occur? Where should it occur? How does that relate to surrounding areas? So if we're up against the neighborhood, what is that transition issue? Um, what's an appropriate scale of development when you've got single family houses a lot away or a couple lots away? So we're looking at both those opportunities and also the different kind of factors shaping TOD projects. And I'll talk more about the factors in a second. Um, the next two steps we're going through, and we're just starting this work now, is we're looking at the financial feasibility of different kinds of projects to see if the, the private development market um, has the potential to deliver the right kinds of projects. Um, and that's an important question for us. We don't want to come up with a bunch of rules that don't make sense and are going to make it difficult for people to, um, to construct and to improve the kinds of places in ways that the community wants. Then we start to move into um, organizing our, um, the comprehensive planning policies, which provide guidance about um, how big buildings can be, how much, how dense they can be, um, and the general <clears throat> form of development. And then the um, zoning code provisions, the, which we call the regulatory framework, um, the policies and strategies that promote equitable development. So how do we um, promote affordable housing, for example, 
How do we maintain existing affordable housing that exists in the surrounding neighborhoods? How do we make it possible for small, smaller scale businesses and investors to get a foothold in the market? Um, and then start to think about the capital investments or the public investments to make things work better. So that could be sidewalk improvements, roadway improvements, uh, the possibility for new public spaces or gathering places along the corridor. And that'll be when we go out to the community later in the spring, we'll bring ideas for those and get feedback on them to make sure we're on the right track before we start to finalize recommendations for the project. So if the factor shaping TOD, they fall in these three big categories, the market conditions and the market context, um, the land, existing land use and urban form that we're trying to fit this new development in, and the mobility and transit accessibility. Um, how can we get, if, if as, as everyone knows, the way you get to a, a, a transit vehicle, whether that's a streetcar or a rapid transit bus or a local bus, is you're going to walk there to some extent, it's either from most likely from your home to the bus stop or the station, and from the station to your workplace or the place that you're going for um, a, a social service or for educational purposes or ed entertainment purposes, but that walk trip is really important. So we're thinking a lot about how people walk to and from the transit service and, and around the community so that walking is a real serious, safe, comfortable, convenient alternative to hopping in your car and driving to meet all your daily needs. So under market conditions, there's a couple different factors that we're going to talk through. It has to do with the retail issues affecting um, the corridor, the way uh, some of the challenges associated with uh, delivering certain kinds of projects. Land use and urban form is really about the diverse conditions that exist along the corridor in different neighborhoods, the um, how much land is really available to support change and not um, impact the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and if there's changes in the neighborhoods themselves that can that can help um, provide additional and more diverse housing types to support community needs. So the market conditions that shape shape both the timing and the types of opportunities. So the introduction of this transit is important for the community, but it doesn't change the fundamentals of how the market's performing. It helps. But it, if, if a place is really struggling to attract investment, if it's hard to fill up, you know, fill up space in an existing building, BRT alone is not going to change that situation. So we really, under, really, really need to understand the underlying market fundamentals as we think about the project. Um, the mixed use potential for projects. So we, you know, in, a, in some respects, we'd really love to see buildings with ground floor retail and workplaces and residential and different levels of affordability of residential in a single building it's really hard to deliver a project that has all of that mix of activity mixed in one single building especially if it's a small building and especially if it's on a small site so we're looking at mixed use but we're thinking about it as mixed use within a district maybe not within individual buildings and then there's the potential mismatch between the sites that are available and the market potential so downtown is a pretty strong market, but there's not a lot of large scale sites available to attract investment to. So we're thinking about how the market can be delivered on what's available. Um, we're also looking at the tools and the programs that are available to support different kinds of equitable outcomes. So money and regulatory strategies that could help support the construction of affordable units or protect existing affordable units. The market conditions are different along different stretches of the corridor and our market. This is the sort of very broad summary of um, the material that you can look at on the website that documents market conditions. But, you know, as we look at this, we on the right hand side, we have those two different colors of gray columns that transit oriented development readiness. So how ready is that area to deliver transit oriented projects and what is the overall market strength? So. The way this kind of plays out is that downtown um, and then to um, still to a fairly strong extent, Tampa Heights and Seminole Heights are ready to support TOD. The market strength is either strong or emerging. Um, the, those conditions change as we get north of the Hillsborough River, um, where we see 
um, more auto-oriented uses, which are you know, not very TOD friendly or TOD ready, and relatively weak market conditions. And that exists across the different sectors, residential, office, and retail, um, from the Hills, Hillsborough, practically from the Hillsborough River all the way out to USF. And there's, there's some pockets of really positive stories to tell along that, but for the most part, it's kind of challenging. And, and if you think about Fowler Avenue over the last 40 years, for example, back when I was at USF, um, it's not the quarter that it used to be. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of individual properties um, and storefronts that are really struggling. And that retail, this, this is not by any means unique to this corridor or the Hillsborough, city of Tampa, Hillsborough County, Tampa Bay region. Um, retail is changing dramatically and, the, and COVID has drastically accelerated the trends that existed before. So we do, we, we at the, at currently anyway, I mean, most of what we do is online, whether that's shopping, recreating, um, even with, um, this, the new um, the new bike technology where you're at home and you're with a spin class and but you're just watching them online. Um, those things used to used to do that out in the world. Um, so the amount of space that's required to support all that activity is right now it's you know dramatically less, and it's probably going to continue to be less in the future. So we're concerned about overall the amount of retail space that's out there that's unoccupied. And the, this site you may recognize this is at the, the southeast corner of um, southeast corner of Nebraska and Fowler. And this property has been vacant for a long time. Um, it's not looking so hot and there's really not an easy solution. This is not likely not going to come back to life as a retail center. It's going to be a different thing in the future. We have to figure out what that's going to be. So um, the, for the retailers that are out there, their margins are slim and getting slimmer. Um, customer expectations have changed about what they're looking for, the kind of places they want to visit. Um, and that's likely to be permanent. So we're, we need to think about that real significant structural change. When we look at it by area, North Florida, Fowler Avenue, um, a lot of that larger, those larger footprint stores um, are in decline. With the exception of discount stores, people will still get in their car to drive to a discount store, but they're not going to um, places like they used to. And we've seen a lot, like for example, if you think about Sports Authority next to University Mall, um, that was a hot place to go 10 years ago and they're gone and they're not coming back. So that overbuilt quality is a big challenge. So we're looking at um, redevelopment and change in use in a lot of locations on the north end of the corridor. In Tampa Heights and Seminole Heights, what we've seen is a lot of people um, coming into existing buildings and creating really interesting uses. There's a lot of restaurants and bars and small shops in quirky spaces, it's because they're relatively inexpensive so that there's a low barrier to entry to start those businesses, which is good, um, but it doesn't create a real destination and it limits the long-term potential for growth. So that fragmentation is one of the challenges that we need to deal with. We're also concerned about um, overzoning or over planning for retail along that corridor. So the places that are working now can continue to thrive in an environment that has maybe more residential, but not a lot more retail inventory. And then downtown is similar to places across the United States. Um, in our case, we've got two major projects that are doing really well. Water Street um, is, you know, it's got the investment backing to be a really successful destination and it's gonna attract a lot of retail activity. The Heights is already working relatively well. They signed a major office tenant into the office building. So they're looking like a really solid location. They'll be spin off to nearby properties, but the locations that aren't close to those big magnets and big hubs of activity may continue to struggle a bit. Um, on the urban design and urban form and, um, and development side of the equation, we don't really have a lot of real estate to work with if we think about where new development is gonna go. We looked at the, what's vacant, so where, where there's no construction now, which is the gray, and you don't see a lot of gray on this map. And then those ranges of red are where there's improvements on those sites, but they're relatively low value to the land value, which means they could be attractive for redevelopment. And you can see that those places are the larger footprint sites up by USF. And you see a couple that are um, the University Mall site, which is carved up into different parcels, is one where there's a cluster of those at the north end of the corridor. 
we see him on Fowler South on Nebraska. So the photograph of that um, vacant shopping center is one of those sites that we need to look at for redevelopment. And then when we get down to the river around Water Tower Park, um, it's straddling the interstate. So we've got the dog track, the old retail centers that are not well used and partially vacant are all candidates for redevelopment over time. And then one of the key findings is there's really not, there's not many sites that are over an acre between Tampa Heights, between basically the Palm Avenue and the river. So where development occurs there is going to be at a relatively small scale. So we need to think about how we um, plan and code for those smaller sites. Downtown, there's a lot of individual blocks, um, but you can, even there, you can see downtown is largely built out. The development opportunities are limited. We just want to make sure that the development that does occur um, continues to create a walkable environment and um, has the uses that support and benefit from access to transit. We're starting to think about the broad, after this analysis, we think about the broad framework for transit-oriented development. So where can that transit-oriented development go and what form might it take? And as I've led to so far in this quick talk is that the, we really have three different kinds of opportunities. There's a suburban retrofit in the North Quarter. So that's retrofit and redevelopment of those suburban sites. And this map shows the, the more rich pink color um, is more saturated pink color is the non-residential, the light pink is residential. So you can see how those, the scale of where the change could occur um, modulates along the corridor. Between the Hillsborough River and roughly Palm Avenue, which is Seminole Heights and, and Tampa Heights, generally along the Florida frontage, um, that's really incremental infill and adaptive reuse. That's going to be smaller scale investment We've seen some really interesting projects delivered over the last couple of years, and we see more of that kind of project happening, and we see that as having a really strong benefit to the community. Introducing new housing types without displacing existing housing and bringing new opportunities for retail and services and other activities to the corridor. And then downtown is really urban infill and redevelopment, the larger scale, truly urban projects um, across the blocks um, within walking distance of the proposed BRT line and the proposed streetcar extension. So the, the next level that, of detail that we go into is we look at what the scale of that opportunity is. So there's starting from north to south or the left side to the right side of the screen. We've got the suburban retrofit opportunities, which are the commercial strip centers shopping centers and big box sites and suburban malls. So kind of that range of scale of sites available for change. In the middle, it's really very small sites and slightly larger sites. So it's less than an acre, um, which is kind of the, that commercial frontage along Florida. If you take a block of that, that's about, it's about an acre exactly, or slightly larger sites. And there's only a handful of those slightly larger sites. Downtown, it's full blocks, so it's which are only about an acre in size, um, or smaller scale infill and redevelopment. So, if you think about the missing pieces, for example, along North Franklin Street, there's a lot of gaps between those old historic buildings. So, there's some great historic building stock, and there's also a lot of parking lots that don't do a lot for to make that place those places better um, or very pleasant to visit. And then when we look beyond the corridor, we think about the neighborhood. So we're looking at a couple of places where there's larger scale redevelopment potential, and that's Robles Park is really the focus of that. Um, the opportunity to introduce new kinds of housing into the neighborhood, we call it missing middle housing. So in between a little single family house and a big apartment building, there's a lot of different residential types that aren't well represented in our market. So if you think about duplexes, townhouses, um, and very small apartments, we see a lot of small apartments and historic small apartments in older neighborhoods throughout Tampa, but we don't see a lot of new ones. And it could be an opportunity for small families, for singles and couples, um, for people entering the market, for older folks that are in a retirement position. There's, there could be new opportunities delivered in the neighborhoods, but we have to be really careful about how we plan for that. So this, we're starting to look at the strategies and um, 
hopefully you'll have a chance to to look through this and the the material that's in the briefing book because this is written up in a little bit more detail but um for urban inf infill and redevelopment it's really continuing a lot of what the city and the downtown partnership and others are advocating for continuing urban infill and redevelopment um smaller scale infill development along north franklin street thinking about how we fill in the missing pieces or the gaps between buildings um, in the project and and in all cases in all locations thinking about how we expand support for affordable housing including on possibly on public owned sites um, that the city could sell off to a developer and those projects could be required to be affordable um, for the incremental infill and adaptive reuse this is where we're the, those areas um, in tampa heights and in uh, Seminole Heights. So the when you say larger, not there's there's not a lot of large scale development opportunities, but there is some between um, there is some south of Columbus Avenue where there's some larger land holdings um, that aren't up against single family homes, and then we're talking about smaller scale infill and adaptive reuse along much of the rest of the corridor. In the suburban retrofit location to the north. There's kind of two sides to the what we need to plan for. It's the phased redevelopment of the larger properties. Um, it's unlikely that someone, I mean, we, we hope for it, but it's unlikely that we're going to get another developer like the one that purchased the University Mall site to pick up other properties and master plan them in the same way they have. So we need to think about how those sites get redeveloped over time um, in phases. So we build toward a more walkable, diverse, pedestrian-friendly environment. And then again, thinking about, uh, in this case, the, it's not the highlighted bullet, but the bottom bullet, how do we make these auto-oriented corridors more walkable and more friendly? So if someone lives in, a, in the neighborhood, um, they can walk easily and comfortably and safely to a transit stop, wait at that stop um, without fearing <laughs> that they're gonna get clipped by a car. Um, or it's simply just an uncomfortable environment to sit and wait for a bus at, um, and then use the bus to get around. So how do we make these places more friendly, more walkable, more safe for those that want to access and take advantage of transit service? And then the neighborhood side, as I mentioned, um, is really about the sensitive infill and maybe a modest change in housing types along the corridor. Um, allowing for a modest increase in density, so maybe filling up um, vacant lots, allowing for some attached building types, duplexes, um, uh, maybe townhouses within walking distance of the proposed stops, but balancing that against the community goals for preserving historic sites and buildings and conserving the naturally occurring affordable housing, those some smaller apartment buildings and single family houses that are affordable now to try to figure out ways to try to maintain that level of affordability. So we paused at this point in the presentation and then you'll see the discussion session uh, in a second. Thank you. On that 100 acre property and on the, just between that 30th Avenue and um, Nebraska, corridor of Fowler, it's bookended by USF and then a very large uh, charter school that's uh, going to be opening up um, this fall. So that corridor right there where there is a lot of that strip mall retail, um, there's a there's a, a very good chance that a lot of that is going to be um, flipping to, um, to better uses soon. And um, the other point I wanted to make is that um, you're absolutely right and that um, you know, the, the, the time is now that we've got to look at um, land use and urban form guidelines to make sure that uh, that we don't miss this opportunity right now. And uh, that, that dovetails nicely with the uh, um, strategic action planning process that we are involved with with the county and several of the anchor institutions up in the Uptown University area. And that's, uh, that's an aspect that uh, we're looking at in that planning process as well. So we do want to make sure that we... Uh, we um, complement complement each other's work with uh, the recommendations that come out of that. Yeah, absolutely. And and we're 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 again at a point now where we're ready to have that kind of more strategic conversation with you all about your plans okay. and how we can reinforce one another's work. Great.
Steve, there was a question in the chat um, from Kitty. Uh, hold on one second. Let me find it. Uh, do we know what the plan is for Sacred Heart property? Um, no, we don't. And if anyone has insight on that, that would be great. Um, we've had some challenges contacting someone to talk about that. Um, I think I think the property just um, by Robles Park is eight to nine acres. Um, they've recently put temporary fencing around it, so I don't know what what they're up to. Um, but we'll, we're going to dig into that. I mean, that is one of, that is a great piece of property. Um, whether that involves conserving and reusing some of the historic buildings on it or not, you know, is subject to more research, but it's, it is really a great opportunity. There's another comment from um, John Patrick. Let's see. Interested in your thought on the transition to TOD over time in suburban retrofit area especially along Fowler. Other than larger retail and institutional anchors, the lots are smaller in frontage and depth. How do you see this area transforming to TOD over time? Oh, John Patrick, you must have gotten with um, <laughs> Lisa to ask the difficult question. Um, the, 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 the challenge is there's going to be a somewhat there's going to be somewhat of an awkward transition period as those places, as, as in our ideal world, they would become more walkable places. The building frontages would flip to the front of Fowler, parking would be in the back, and you would be able to walk from place to place and not drive from place to place. The way that we're thinking about it, we have a, a study under now to look at the feedback from the some of the feedback from somebody. There you go. Um, we're starting to think about focusing um, attention on the stop locations and the corner sites. So those are the sites that have the potential to be a bridge between the neighborhood, so all the great work um, University of CDC is doing, and the transit stop along Fowler. So if we can think about trying to bring um, development to define the corner locations, um, that would be that. That's what we're thinking about as the starting point. That's what we're starting to do some sketches for now. So it, it, that would be what we would try to do. Now, some of those corner locations are gas stations. Gas stations are really difficult to turn over over time. They're more of the most expensive sites to redevelop along a corridor like this. So there's some constraints to that. But um, we really think that corner, thinking about the neighborhood to stop connection is the first thing to think about. So that's first priority. Second priority is the, the Fowler frontage itself. So we would all like it to look better. But what we really need is for the neighborhoods to be able to access transit on a safe, comfortable sidewalk and possibly add some additional uses along that frontage to support their development and, you know, support the building of those communities. Hey, hey uh, Steve, I'm sorry, this is David. To, to that question, uh, the TOD stop location, then um, are you planning it in conjunction because I heard you talk about the walkability for people to be able to park because it has to accommodate um, you know, the ample um, amount of parking to encourage walkability so people can actually pull there and connect to this uh, transit and be able to mm -hmm. not walk, the, I mean, drive the whole distance to their location. That's a, so, good, that's, a good, that's a good point to pause on and talk about a little bit more. The, um, for the arterial BRT project, that's primarily thought of as a walk-up service um, and a transfer service. So you could take an east-west line along Hillsborough, transfer to north-south along Florida, and get to USF or get to downtown. Um, we're not planning for parking at stations. Um, it's been the subject of discussion for the regional rapid transit project because that's more of a long-haul trip. So they're thinking more about a park-and-ride condition at those stop locations. But even then, there's been a lot of pushback from the neighborhoods about um, large-scale park-and-ride facilities that get kind of wedged into the neighborhood. So our, mostly what we're looking at is parking to serve the uses that were proposed. Um, and that by itself has different challenges by location because 
as you know, as, as you all know, um, there's been a lot of controversy about popular locations along Florida and the spillover parking in the surrounding neighborhood. So it's great to have a small use with limited parking, but when that use gets popular, there's no other places for those cars to go. And so there's, there's every, most, virtually every business along Florida that's been successful also has a whole set of signs that says don't park in the neighborhood. And they're trying to lease parking spaces elsewhere. So striking that balance is, 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 is among the things that we're trying to puzzle through now. Yeah, Steve, if I could tie into that um, along the lines of not putting a bunch of parking near our stations throughout the neighborhoods, a lot of those connections we're hoping to make by other modes. Uh, we know that the walkability isn't perfect in a lot of these spots, but the access via, you know, bike or scooter um, is a lot more attractive uh, in these areas, and some of these communities have shown a propensity to use those modes quite a bit, especially the further south you get where some of the programs have been rolled out. Um, but I did want to, that kind of segues back to the earlier conversation that David raised, um, uh, Mr. Ilibanya with the Housing Authority. When I was able to speak with your consultants for Robles specifically, I, I particularly outlined the, the point of being a little more aggressive with the density uh, for that project as it relates to our TOD study and hoping that we could pause that final product so it could be informed by this study. Um, we've been pretty passionately trying to uh, push that uh, onto you guys um, for the last year or so. They really, they, they understood where I was coming from. Uh, I made some comments on the site plan to focus some of the workforce density closer to the corridor, not so much internal to the site, not placing the retirement or older units that were planned in the site plan as close to the corridor as they were in the original uh, master plan document that was shared. Those were a few major items. Um, and I also relayed some information that is really specific to the work that I've done in the last few years uh, whether before my time at heart as a consultant for FDOT, uh, there's been more outreach done in the lower half of this corridor than a lot of other places historically. And what we've learned through that outreach, is particularly from the DOT's outreach, whether it be related to the interstate or the local uh, corridor on Florida Avenue, is that there's an appetite for robust transit here and more of an appetite for transit supportive density than you might expect in some other areas. So I just wanted to reiterate what Steve was saying uh, to make sure that he's just not getting himself in trouble. <laughs> but uh, there, there, that conversation is going to be had, uh, as Steve alluded to, and it has been had to a certain extent. So I would, uh, again, would hate to see the opportunity for the biggest redevelopment parcel in on the corridor to be six months too early to be finalized before the product of this study can really inform it in a, in a really constructive way. Um, we, we know the mayor is really passionate about uh, units and affordability, um, so I just wanted to reiterate what Steve said and say that there's a lot of a lot of moving parts here, but I think that we can get the timing right. So uh, definitely get with Steve and any way we can help that part, uh, please let us know. Thanks. Um, anyone else want to jump in? I didn't see any more questions come up. Did I miss anything, Michelle? No, the chat's been a little quieter this time. Because I talk too much. <laughs> Steve, maybe we can um, share a little bit about our next steps and um, that we plan on doing some engagement with the public community and touch a little bit about the um, housing workshop. Yeah, um, yeah, Nicole, I appreciate you said that because I didn't have a specific slide for it. I was going to go back up to that early slide about where we're headed. Um, and so SB Friedman is on our team to look at housing affordability. Um, we've been looking um, at it from two places right now. We've been looking at just the, the basic supply-demand question. So what is, what's available in the market now to support demand? Of, obviously, there's 
never enough affordable units to support the demand. Um, so anything we can create is great, but we're also trying to get a, a, a more fine-grained sense of that question. And then also, um, the trying to dig through the trying to dig through the discussions that have happened just over the last year to two years about housing affordability in the city and the county, <clears throat> and trying to get up to speed with those efforts. So we're at a point now where um, we're reaching out to our partners at the city, the county, the planning commission, and the MPO to try to understand how our analysis of affordability is uh, relates to work that there's there's underway or is planned in those agencies. And we'd like to have some form of either we'll sponsor and get other folks on board or someone else will sponsor and we'll participate, but we're trying to figure out how to get a housing affordability workshop, focused workshop set up over the next probably month to a month and a half um, so we can make sure that these um, initiatives are stitched together better. We don't want to have, like, spit out our recommendations about what we think is great for this quarter and miss the mark with what others are working on. So we want to look at look for a higher level of alignment and then take those out into public workshops later in the spring. So if we're into the April, May kind of time frame for our public workshops, we'd like to get that affordability discussion underway in the next month. We have a question in the chat um, from Kitty. What is the percentage of green space that is recommended in the proposed density that you are planning? Is there a formula that guides the amount of green space that should be planned um, for livability and health issues? Yes, um, I, that's, that's a great question. And I can tell you that right now, um, we, we generally believe that the open space should be provided at the neighborhood level, not project by project. So if we have someone with an acre of land um, and we ask them to set aside 10% of their site for um, public open space, that's not a meaningful amount of public open space to deliver in a community. So we're trying to look at ways to do that um, by um, reinvesting in existing open spaces or working with the city to identify and the county to identify potential sites to acquire to develop larger footprint public spaces that really serve the whole neighborhood. So we're not very advanced in that, that discussion right now, but that's something we're just starting. Um, do we want to show people the update to the website uh, where they can find our documents? We would, and in terms of, um, to go back to what Nicole just said about the public workshops, is that we're still in this period where we're not quite sure um, what the COVID condition is going to be late spring. Our assumption is a lot of the outreach we're going to need to do is going to be virtual. So we're looking at ways to do that. You know, it, uh, I think we're going to have to kind of do an all of the above strategy so we can get multiple different kinds of opportunities for folks to engage with us. If you have um, knowledge or connections with the neighborhood associations along the corridor, please ask them how best we can bring ideas to the table in a format that works for them, and then we'll adjust to fit um, the, the neighborhoods, how the neighborhoods were working together. Um, that would be the, you know, the best way to do it is to work through existing channels. So if you can help us open some of those doors, that'd be fabulous, uh, and we'll continue to think about ways to get the word out. Michelle, do you want to go ahead and go through the last couple, and then if we can still hang for a minute if people have questions? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so we wanted to let people know that we um, have added a tab in our website for the documents that we've created the context assessment and the briefing book. So if I can share my screen really quick, I'll show where that is. Um, let's see. Oh, did that work? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so here's the home page of our website. Let's go back. We've added this tab here, uh, documents. And then over here on the right, um, we have our briefing book, which is 
like the Cliff Notes version of the context assessment. Um, and we have it set up as spreads or single page. So if you wanted to print, um, you'd probably want to use single page. But just to open one up really quick, you just click on that. You'll get this screen briefly. Um, you're and it looks like this. You can press star six anytime to <coughs> unmute yourself. And I think we sent a link um, to this prior to the meeting, right, Steve? Yes, we did. An we, email. We, uh, okay. The email that I sent out um, either Monday or Tuesday has a link to it. Um, so, and we covered a lot of those bases that are in here on the call. But if you flip through there and you have any questions about anything, we can. We're happy to either guide you to the right place in the context assessment or just have a conversation and fill you in on where we're headed. So, is the what you'll start to what you'll see next from us is. We'll begin to outline the recommendations for the plan to let you know where we're headed. We'll do some additional mapping that sort of talks about how these ideas about form and scale land in different locations along the quarter, and then start to test people's level of comfort with what we're showing. Um, we'll also advance ideas for um, housing affordability strategy. Again, that's sort of a broad brush that covers the full quarter. And we'll look at the potential public investments in bike ped infrastructure in public spaces and ways to improve accessibility and livability along the corridor and in the surrounding neighborhoods. And I'm sharing this um, page really quick because we did get a comment in, in the chat about where can we find this um, recorded live stream. That would be um, eventually, yeah, in a couple days or so, um, on this project team tab. Here is where we actually have the November 18th live stream. Um, and then I believe this goes to Hart's, let's see. So it goes to Hart's YouTube page. Just to share, Michelle, we did have some. Let me turn that off. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not sure what I'm doing. OK, there we go. Just to share, <laughs> Michelle. Michelle. <clears throat> yep. We did have we a little bit of issues, have a little bit of with, issues the with the sound on the, sound on the YouTube video. video. So we're not quite sure how much, quite sure how much has, sound with has sound with it. Oh, for this meeting now, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll, we'll definitely get the, the presentation up on the website, so it'll go on that same page for the working group materials. Um, and then... Uh, if we did have a sound issue, maybe we can do a quick recording of just the presentation so I can just go up and do that again so we can get a, get the recording up so you can get some of the um, some of the verbal associated with the slides. Yeah, that would be great. Good. Well, Nicole, I think we're all set. If there's no more questions, is there anything else in the chat? Uh, there was a um, just a recommendation um, from Kimber Kimberly Oberman uh, to call Tim Keyports. Um, so we will do that to get on. Um, sorry, <laughs> OS. H yeah, to get on their agenda. So thank you for that. Yes, yeah, Central Heights Neighborhood Association. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That Tim is actually president of both the Old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association, but also of the Heights Urban Core Chamber. Um, he's so he's a good person to try and figure out how to get in front of either of those groups first. Um, Stan Lasseter, I believe, is still involved with Southeast Seminole Heights, um, Tampa Heights Civic Association. Uh, I know Rick Fernandez was. Um, in a leadership position there. He's on the MPO CAC. Um, let's see, in South Seminole Heights, I will, I'd have to actually look and see who's on the board there. But all of those neighborhood associations have virtual meetings of which you could do this presentation. It would have to be abbreviated, but you'd be able to reach out and, sure. okay. um, and be able to actually get the points across and get some feedback. Um, because they, they are virtual, so typically they're not, you know, four or five hours long. And they always have, you know, robust agendas. But 
But there are active neighborhood associations in this area. And then if you go further up, I believe um, Forest Hills has a pretty active group, so that's sort of on the way. They need a little off beaten path, but it, that community, I'm sure, is very interested. Uh, as well as, you know, the, the university, CDC, would be a great partner for being able to reach out to people in the community. So I, I know that given what's happening up in that particular area. but So I, re I highly recommend reaching out to those various different neighborhood groups because they've had to try and keep people connected over this time period and that you'll find value in reaching out to them. And of course, I want to talk to you about the affordable housing. So, yes, definitely. <laughs> all right, great. Um, thank you. Thank you for doing this today. Sure. Just for reference, we we do have all the neighborhood association reps on the invitation. Um, we've tried to keep those up to date, but we can double check them, and then we'll reach out directly because um, we this would be it'd be great to be able to jump on their meetings to get this on folks as right here. So we appreciate that. Um, quickly, I guess we're, we're close to time. Um, there was a question about the east-west corridors. Um, we didn't show the mapping, but we looked at both the actual walk distance from the proposed stops measured along street center lines. So instead of just using the radius, we actually measured the distance. And so we do go east of 275 in several locations just for the half mile walk distance. Um, so we get into East Tampa. Um, at a half mile distance, and then bike distance, we did a map. We did a three mile map on existing street center lines. We didn't we didn't constrain that by bike facilities, but it's just a broad map that indicates the range that's um, accessible by bike. So we have those two maps in the context report, um, and so we'll, we can bring that up in a future call is to talk about the, really the full extent of people that have access to the stops, because the bike distance does get us a big chunk of. Uh, west side of East Tampa and to the river, and in some cases across the river on the west side. Um, I think there's one more question. Um, sorry, I looked away for a moment. Okay, um, Josh uh, Frank has a question. Um, I have a question. Oh, you did. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get. Yeah. I'm like cleaning up my notes over here. Okay. <laughs> and we're Thanks. we're close to 4:30. We don't want to keep you guys any longer than we need to. So it sounds like we're we probably have covered the bases. Um, we sent to us directly. So I think the next slide. Um, reach out to Nicole is the project manager, so she's your point person at heart. But reach out to any of us directly. We'll share your email and notes, and we'll make sure that we get back to you with any questions. So we're happy to, um, you know, the more contact we have with folks active along the corridor that care about what's happening, the better off we're going to be able to, you know, the better we're going to be able to do our work um, on the project. So reach out when you, when you can, um, and we can tackle additional questions or feed you additional information um, and continue the discussion about the future of the quarter. So we really appreciate it. We've got another one of these scheduled in two months. Um, we'll be bringing to you on that call more details about the state of the recommendations um, and also a proposal for public engagement activities. Um, we'll run that by you as we're, as we're starting to roll those out, and that, that time frame would take us into um, in late April to May for, um, or I guess May, for the public workshops, so we'll give you all a heads up about that before we get too far down the road. Thank you, everybody. We're going to go right. now. Thank you.